Kelly is a graduate of Southern Methodist University with a degree in finance, accounting, and a minor in business law, contracts, and Ladies, okay, now we got some action going on up here. All right, hope everyone enjoyed the lunch. We're going to make the announcements uh, that all the speakers, uh, their videos, uh, audios are available for sale out in the foyer. Also, the tickets for the upcoming concert for um, Miss Vanessa Bell Armstrong is coming up. And today, the pastor says that since you are here, the wonderful gift to use, you can get them for $15. After today, they will be 20, and it is October the 13th. So hopefully we're going to go ahead on with our next speaker. Give a round and sound of applause for coming up. And also, God bless everybody. Survey? Okay, forgot the survey. That's the main reason I was up here. Uh, the surveys are going to be given out. We do want your input on it so that how we can continue doing what we're doing great in the areas that we may need to improve in. So ladies, if you will fill those out and give those to the ushers, we greatly appreciate it. Thank you. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. Through spending quiet time with the Lord, Brindia is learning to trust God with all of her heart and not to lean on her own understanding. In all of her ways, she acknowledges God and he is directing her path daily. Brindia serves under Pastor F.D. Scott at Mount Calvary Baptist Church as Christian Education Ministry Leader, Sunday School Teacher, Beerens Women's Class, and Bible Study Teacher. She is a retired ethics consultant from Alabama Power Company and presently serves as Parental Engagement Coordinator at Togo Elementary School and volunteers as chaplain with the Birmingham Police Department. Brindia has a BA degree in Business Education from Stillman College, MA degree Guidance and Counseling, Hunter College, New York, Certificate of Biblical Studies, Birmingham Eastenon Seminary, MA degree Christian Education, Birmingham Theological Seminary, Continuing Biblical Studies, Beeson School of Divinity, Lay Academy. The glory of God truly shines in Brindia's life and many have come to love her as a teacher, speaker at many women's conferences, seminars, workshops, and retreats. Please join me in welcoming our next dynamic speaker, Sister Brindia McCray. Look at God. 
Look at God. But I should not be surprised, Dr. Wesley and I go a way back. We were at the uh, Baptist Bible College together, and I always tell this story. We were in one of our professor's classes, and Dr. Wesley had the nerve to ask a question. And the, the professor was not too pleased with the question he asked and told him he need not question him in front of his students. But Dr. Wesley said, I need to know the answers. So we just praise and thank God for his spirit of excellence and also his beautiful wife. And we thank God for your beautiful ministry here. Uh, let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we love you today. We honor you and we praise you, Lord. We just thank you that you're God and you're God all by yourself. Father God, we just thank you for all the women who gathered here today. We thank you for the men. God, we just thank you that you do all things decently and in order. We thank you for the word that have already gone forth, Father God. Now, right now, let me decrease as you increase, Lord, none of me and all of you. Father God, we thank you that you will continue to enlighten our eyes, that we will never be the same again after we leave this place, and we'll continue to glorify you and praise you. In Jesus' name, we do pray, amen, and thank God. Thank you, Lord. We just praise and thank God for your beautiful theme, and we were just blessed this morning from the word that have gone forth, and I, I looked at, we have different styles of different speakers, and anytime I'm in the uh, midst of Sister Brenda Minister Clark, I said, Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So you all just accept my style. God has given it to me, and that's all I can be, in the name of Jesus. Uh, my topic today will be success in God's eyes. Success in God's eyes, the spiritual realm. To keep up with our busy schedules, we use all types of planners and calendars. We have day timers. We have day timers by Franklin. We have planners day by day. We have planners month by month. We have planners year by year. We have student planners, at a glance planners. We have create your own planners. We have reminders on the refrigerator. Smart refrigerators have built-in calendars. We have alarms on our phones to remind us of our appointments. All these planners to know where we're supposed to be, when we're supposed to be there, with whom and why. We plan, we plan, and we plan. And we should plan, but planning helps us to be successful. But most importantly, we should leave room for God to intervene. But there are so many truths to be considered about God's role in our planning and being successful. Beth Moore, in her study on James, Mercy Triumphs, she says God is the one with the real plan. We have all sorts of plans jotted on our calendars pertaining to the next year, but they are mostly based on theory. James, in the fourth chapter, says, now listen, you who say, Today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city. Spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why do you not even know what will happen tomorrow? What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live this and do this and do that. As we strive to flourish and prosper and succeed, remember God is the author of all success. One of the key words that the Bible uses to describe success is prosperity. Being prosperous. Some of us love that word and some of us hate that word. Some people say, honey, they, they, they preach that prosperity ministry. Well, God wants us to be prosperous. Most modern dictionaries define prosperous as successful in material terms, flourishing financially and bringing wealth and success. But Bible prosperity is whole person prosperity. The world's perspective of success is setting a goal and accomplishing it. And that means that we have individual interpretations of success. To a football coach, a national championship, a national championship would be a goal. To the college student, a degree would be success. To a salesman, to be number one would be success. To a parent, godly children would be a success. But the Christian's perspective of success is not my will, but God's will be done. 
It's all about character. It's about obedience. It's about relationship with God and with others. Success is to continue desiring to be the person God has called you to be and achieve these goals that God has helped you to set. The true reward of base, God-based success is inner peace. A lot of people are successful in their own eyes, but they have no peace. God-based success, you have some joy. You have some contentment. You have eternal life. You have some health and you have some wholeness with the spirit, the mind, and the body. With God-based success, you have family love and a living relationship with God. Because remember, Proverbs tell us to trust in the Lord with all our heart and don't lean into our own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct our path. Third John 3 and 2 says, Beloved, I pray that you prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. Now this covers materially, socially, naturally, financially, emotionally, spiritually, in everyday endeavors, in your vocations, in your services to God, relationship with family members and friends. Prosper as your soul prospers. That means that you would have genuine success. It begins on the inside, and it works its way out. You know the song said, there's something on the inside that's working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. The challenge then is to grow spiritually, and as we do, the outer manifestations of prosperity will appear in the form of fruitfulness and blessings. Now, we need to understand that God's truth is for all people at all times. But the application of God's truth to your life is always personal and direct. A lot of times we look at other people being successful and we want to follow their path. That might not be your path. God got a path for you. The principles of success in God's word do not change. But the application of those principles is always highly individualized under the direction of the Holy Spirit. God's word is eternal, but it's also timely. God's word is universal, but it's also personal. God's word is absolute truth, but it's practical in providing day-to-day -day advice. In the book of Jeremiah, God speaks of the 70 years of judgment in Babylon that the nation of Israel will suffer through. These people were incredible pain. They were mourning death. They were making a move and transitioning to slavery in another city. If you know the history of the Israelites, they had a five-fold pattern. They would be in good grace with God. Then they would sin. God's wrath would fall on them. They would repent. God would restore. And they'll start all over again. And that sounds just like us, doesn't it? But God kept sending people to warn them, to tell them what would happen if you continue to disobey me. So when they got ready to go into Babylon, then they went in ships. Some people stayed, others left, some didn't want to go, others wanted to go. False prophets were telling them different things. It's the same thing today. And we like to tune in to the one that sounds good to us. But that's what happens when you don't know the word of God. That's why he says study. To show yourself approved unto God. Workmen that needed not to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. These people were in so much pain. They didn't know exactly what to do because they were exiles in another city. And we need to know that by right, we are exiles also. This is not our home. We're just passing through. So that's why the Israelites were told to go over in Babylon, make yourselves comfortable, make you some families, do what God would have you to do and go on in life because the false prophets are telling you you'll be back in a few years, but no, you're going to be back in 70 years. Now, it's one thing to know your future, isn't it? you in the midst of all of this. And remember now, all of them didn't get a chance to come back because some died out. 
So some of this were going to be for their children and generation after generation. So in the midst of all of this going on, God reassures and reminds them of who he is. He says in Jeremiah 29, 11 through 14, for I know, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me. When you seek me with all your heart, he said, I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. A lot of us are in captivity, and we don't even know it. We think we are free, but we are in captivity. You might ask, why am I in captivity? Some of our jobs held us captive. Some of our, we have other people who hold us in captivity. We have addictions. Now, when we hear the word addictions, we think of drug addictions, but there are a lot of addictions. We got some people who are addicted to shopping. Some folks are addicted to eating. Some people are addicted to gossiping. Some people are addicted to Facebook. And that computer and the phone, we have many, many addictions that hold us in captivity. But then the Lord said, he said, I'm going to gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carry you into exile. So when God starts a work, he always completes that work. And this is the key part here, which is interesting. Sometimes we get in places where... We don't want to be. We don't even know how we got there, but we are angry with everybody and pointing fingers because we are there. But Jeremiah, the Lord spoke through Jeremiah and said, and seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare, you will have welfare. Seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive and pray unto the Lord for it, for in the peace thereof you will have peace. So wherever you are in your life, don't try to make it miserable for other folk. We know that misery loves company, but just cause you going through, everybody ain't going through. Why are you mad with everybody? Yeah, that, that's your struggle at that time. Because God leading you to a place that he's taking you. We feel better when we cast our blame on somebody else. Yeah, when you get it off you, you feel okay. But he said you seek the welfare of the city. And in their welfare, you will have welfare. So in your house, if you mad with somebody, you seek the welfare of the house. Seek the peace of the house. And in it, you will have welfare, and you will have peace. A few chapters later, Jeremiah writes in 31, 31st chapter, The Lord hath appeared unto all unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. God reminds his servant that his painful actions toward his people are rooted in a love that will never end. It is with this love that he draws his people closer to himself, through the trials of life. And we need to know that when we go through, God is drawing us. See, God speaks in mysterious ways. He, he can speak through our conscience. Yeah, yeah, sometimes he speaks in a still, small voice. Sometimes he might speak through a billboard. He'll speak through a child. He'll speak through an enemy. Yeah, you know he'll bring a blessing through your enemy, don't you? You just need to recognize the gift. Recognize the blessing and stop looking at the one who's bringing it. Yeah. Ephesians 2 and 10 said, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, 
which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. You see, God is a master sculptor, skillfully sculpting his masterpiece. A.W. Tozer, uh, Tozer wrote, it is doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. It is doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. If God sets out to make you an unusual Christian, he is not likely to be as gentle as he is usually pictured by the popular teachers. We all want to be just like Jesus, but we don't want to go through nothing. We all want to have all the crowns, but we don't want any crosses. We just all want the good part of Jesus, but we want to know what he went through. A marble sculptor does not use a manicure set to reduce the rude, unshapely marble of a thing of beauty. The saw, the hammer, and the chisel are cruel tools. But without them, the rough stone must remain forever formless and unbeautiful. And even when, 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 when Jeremiah had to go to the potter's house, we know that the potter will put you back together again. Yeah, 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 when he puts you on that wheel, you might think you're spinning too fast. But God knows when to stop the wheel. God knows when to stop the wheel. You might think it's time for you to come out the fire, yeah? But God knows it's not time. And our prayer sometimes, as soon as we get in, we want to get out. God said, no, I need you to learn something while you're in the fire. I need you to learn something when you are going through. For the end goal of the painful process is Romans 8, 28. And we love that one. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord to them who are the called according to his purpose. And let us remember, those who don't know the Lord, you can't quote that and claim it. You might say it, but it don't belong to you if you are not the called according to his purpose. Let's keep in mind that God's masterpiece would only be fully completed once we see our Savior face to face. 1 John 3 and 2 says, Beloved, now we are, we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Philippians 1 and 6 says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So the important question you can ask yourselves is, what is it that the Lord wants me to be and to do today? What is it that the Lord wants me to be and to do today? Even with our children, we're telling them what they need to be because we're looking at how much the career pays. And when you get all your degrees and all your training and then you get a job, you're not happy. You're miserable because you were going for the mighty dollar. But you didn't go for what God had put in you. Each of us has a gift. And God gave it to you because he knew how he wanted you to use it. And if you don't know what your gift is, please try to find out what it is. That's why we have a lot of uh, uh, confusion in our churches, on our jobs. Because first of all, we've been called, to, we're doing stuff we ain't been called to do. Yeah! Yeah, yeah, yeah! We got a lot of folks teaching in school. They ain't been called to teach. That's why children get on their nerves. Now I know even if you've been called, they can get on your nerves. But you ought to have some patience sometime if you've been called to teach. Yeah, yeah, we got folks working in church. They want to do everything and they ain't been called to do it. Yeah, then they get mad if you don't let them in. I don't know why I can't be a greeter, because you ain't never smiling at nobody. you see 
sitting up looking at people use your gift, you might say, I wish I could do that, but God may have something else for you to do. Now, if you don't know what your gift is, pray and ask God. There are a lot of inventories that you may take that can help you identify your gift. But one way to find out what your gift is not, <laughs> if you get up and start doing something, some people just sit down and criticize everybody else, but at least get up and start doing something and you'll find out what your gift is not. Usually your gift is something you feel comfortable doing. Something that, that nobody trained you to do. Nobody told you to like it. It's just a part of you. That's your gift. And sometimes other people see your gift before you know what your gift is. Because it comes so naturally that you don't even know it's a gift. But believe me, if you are a believer, you have at least one gift, and you might have some more. So ask, Lord, what is it you want me to be? See, a lot of us want to do, and we ain't being. God wants you to be, and then you start doing something. Are you saved, first of all? Yeah, we want to go in church and just do everything you ain't saved. We want to be in positions and you have not been trained. Be a disciple. Some, sometimes at our church they want to know, well, when are we going to start our training? I said, you need to start coming to Sunday school. That's where your training starts. Yeah, yeah, come to Bible study. Come to prayer meeting. Yeah, then we can get down to the other stuff. You need to be a disciple. Yeah, some of us are still converts. And that's a good thing, but you don't need to stop at being a convert. You need to be a disciple, a follower, a learner of Jesus Christ. So you know what God wants you to be and do. Success is an ongoing pursuit. It's not a quantity that can be measured or a concept that can be fully defined. It is a concept that is embedded in a process. You think you need to know, you think you know what you need, but you don't know. God made you. God know who he made you to be. So doesn't it make sense to consult the creator about what the creature needs to be and do? Proverbs 14 and 12 said, there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So how am I going to find out what God wants me to be and what he wants me to do? That means we must spend time with God. Out of all of our busy schedules, we just don't have time to spend with God. Some of us get excited on Sunday for Sabbath. We may get excited for Bible study, so I'm not. But on Sunday... We're excited. Some get more excited when we have women conferences because we're with all the ladies coming in. But don't you know when you've had individual worship time with God, when all the saints get together, what a time, what a time, what a time. As I sat this morning and listened to the different women's talk, I just kept hearing words about, I'm praying for this and I'm praying for this. And girl, I'm praying. That's a good thing. I heard that all around me, I've been praying for this. I'm so glad you prayed. That's what it's about. Praying and asking God what you want. So when spending time with God, the first thing you need to do is to pray. Ask God to reveal himself to you and what he wants you to learn. When we study our Bible, or even today, you probably think of the folks you wish were here. So-and-so I need to hear this. So-and-so I need to hear that. No, you need to hear, because you are here, and that's who God wants to hear it. Now, other speakers have said, pass it on, but the fact that you are here, you need to hear it. So pray and ask God, what, what, what reveal yourself to me, Lord? Some people say, well, the Lord ain't, ain't never spoke to me. Well, then when you say that, you told me you ain't read your Bible. 
God speaks through his word. Yeah, we might have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and all those other uh, books of the Bible, but God is speaking throughout the Bible. That's him talking. So we need to listen to him. Now, he does speak in other ways because he'll speak through letting you lose your job. He talking. He talking while we see him talking about and so-and-so didn't treat me fairly. And they hired somebody else. God talking. Listen to him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes when, and this is not all the time, but sometimes when we are sick, God is speaking. Lord, why this happened to me? Speak to God. He'll talk back to you. So ask him. That's your first time you're going to pray. Lord, reveal yourself to me. Then read a devotional to get your mind focused. I love devotionals. And you all have one. Your pastor writes every day. Stress in the rain. And see, when you get your mind focused on a devotional, at least the devil won't have your mind going everywhere. Because you know how the devil will intervene even when you get ready to pray. He'll intervene when you're trying to talk to him. So if you focus on a devotional that has a scripture reference, then that will lead you in the right direction. Some of you might be familiar with, uh, we talked about stressing the rail, God's calling, Jesus called. My utmost for his highest, streams in the desert, in touch. So many devotionals are out there. The daily bread, read that. Sometimes, some people say, well, I, I just don't have time. I'm running in the morning. Well, God will allow things to happen in your life that I bet you will have time. He'll start taking you so fast and you'll be anxious about so many things that you'll have to take time. Lord, fix it. Lord, fix it. There's a story told about the little boy went to the circus, to the fair with his father, and his father bought tickets and gave him some of the tickets, and he told him to go and do your rides and all and come back and get the rest of the tickets. I don't want you to lose them. So the little boy was gone for a while, and in a few minutes, another child came up to the father and said, I need some tickets. And the dad looking around and said, tickets, you're not my child. Where, where you come from? And pretty soon the father's son came up and said, Daddy, I told him to come and get some tickets, but I forgot to tell him that you were my daddy. Some of us don't have any tickets. We go to the Lord, but we ain't got no tickets. You need to get you some tickets to go to the Lord. That means you need to build a relationship with God. And you build a relationship by spending time with him. Joshua 1 and 8 say, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. All of us want to be successful. This is the formula. Meditate on his word day in and day out. And then after you prayed and asked God to reveal himself, you read a devotion, you read the Bible, and, and there are a lot of reading plans for you to read about, but you need to start reading your Bible. It's good for us to come to church and hear good sermons and hear good teaching, but you need to read your Bible. They have audio Bibles now. You can just hear Somebody reading the scripture because that is the best way for you to pray, which is the next step. Some people say, well, I, I don't know what to pray. Now, I know when we get in tough trouble, we just say, Jesus, help me. Have mercy, Lord. And he does hear that. That is a prayer. But you know the best way to pray is to pray the word of God. Pray his word over what you are concerned about. His word is already settled in heaven. He, the psalmist say, his word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin to God. He said, heaven and earth going to pass away. But my word, his word, we need to know God's word. And when you are praying God's word, did you know you can open your Bible and pray? Some folks would, I don't know how to call back to scripture. Well, open your Bible up. Nobody said your eyes had to be closed. 
Psalms 23. Lord, I thank you that you are my shepherd and I shall not want. That's a prayer. You ain't got to have your eyes closed. Lord, you said you are my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Even when my enemies and my foes come around me, they stumble and fall. Tell the God what you want. Thank you, Lord. He said all of his promises are yes and amen. He said you have not because you ask not. And then when you ask, sometimes you ask amiss. Your motive is wrong. Your motives are not pure. But you learn all of that through studying God's word. And when you pray, you can pray loud. You can pray silently. You can even journal. And I thank God in our little bag, we got a, a, a little journal. Isn't that amazing? They, they giving us what we need. But see, when you journal, you got to take time to write stuff down. And you've got to be careful what you write. But it's good because sometimes you might pass on and somebody might get your journal. A lot of people have written devotionals from their parents' journals. They have written devotionals from what was journal while their parents were meditating on the word of God. Prayer does not need to be an attachment. Prayer does not need to be an addendum. See, some of us don't pray until we get in trouble. But if you spend time with God and your whole life is a prayer, you driving along, Lord, I thank you, I got a car to drive. God, you drive this vehicle and all the ones around me. Father God, help me find a parking space right now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. God does hear and answer prayer. Lord, I'm getting ready to go to work today. I don't know what I might face, but you told me to trust you with all my heart and don't lean into my own understanding. Acknowledge you in all your ways, and you would direct my path. Yeah! 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 Bring his word back to him. He said, bring every thought captive under the obedience of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Jesus. You got to know the word of God. Call it back to him. And I just love when you pray, you can call folks' names out. Yeah, I remember once I was praying for my youngest son, and, and I, God gave me a dream that night. So I, something happening in social studies ain't just right. He didn't show me what it was, but the next morning I said, how you doing in social studies? He said, I'm, I'm doing okay. Why you ask? I said, I just asked that same day a note came home from the social studies teacher saying he ain't doing his work. He got up the next morning. He said, what's your dream last night? I said, you ain't got to worry about what I'm dreaming. You just do what you need to do. If you know your children's teacher, call him by name. Let so-and-so treat my baby right. He might not be the smartest, but let him take patience with my baby. Yeah! In the name of Jesus. I remember when my younger son went to Tennessee State and he got a scholarship to play football. And one Sunday we were still at church and the coach called and said, I don't know that this boy might not work out. He, he, he can't do nothing on the field. And, Lord, I started praying. I said, Lord, let the coach see something in him that ain't manifested itself yet. Thank you, Lord. Whatever concerns you concerns God. Tell him about it. And I don't know about you. Can't nobody tell my testimony like I can. 
Father God. And then listen to inspirational music throughout the day. I'm not saying all you got to listen to is, is gospel music and praise and worship, but let it be productive, something that's inspirational. See what you feed your filter with. When it's time to make decisions, that's what's going to come out your filter. If you ain't read no word, if you ain't heard no good godly music, but all you know is the rap, and the jazz could be okay. All of that could be okay, but you've been listening to Oprah. Says some good things sometimes. Dr. Judah, Judge, and all them folk may say some good things, but they're not necessarily the word. But when you make your decision, whatever your filter is, it's going to come through that filter. So when you make a decision, you ought to be, your filter ought to be the word. When you go to folks and ask them for advice, you need to go to some godly folk. You just don't ask anybody advice. See, some of us like to go to folks who are going to give us the advice we want to hear, not what's godly. Thank you, Father God. So we must spend time with God. When Jeremiah say, seek God's face. Seek him with your whole heart. Set some time on your planner to meet with God. You got your nail appointment. You got your hair appointment. You got the children's football game. You might have Bible study. You got your sorority meeting, your fraternity, all those meetings. Do you have some time for God? You might start off with five minutes. If you ain't doing nothing now, just set aside five minutes. And I declare, oh, taste and see. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. The more time you spend with him, you're going to have to pull away in order to get where you're going. And as I take my seat, until you meet the master face to face, that's when you're going to realize whether or not you're successful. See, we are disappointed sometimes because I didn't, I didn't get that job I wanted. My baby didn't get that scholarship. My marriage didn't work. I don't have a husband yet. I don't have children yet. But when you meet the master, face to face, Lori Klein in her poem says, I had walked life's way with an easy tread, had followed where comforts and pleasures led, until one day in a quiet place, I met the master face to face. With station and rank and wealth for my goal, much thought for my body, but none for my soul. I had entered to win in life's mad race when I met the master face to face. I had built my castles and built them high, with their domes had pierced the blue of the sky. I had sworn to rule with an iron mace when I met the master face to face. I met him and knew him and blushed to see that his eyes full of sorrow were fixed on me. And I faltered and fell at his feet that day while my castles melted and vanished away. Melted and vanished and in their place, naught else did I see but the master's face. And I cried aloud, oh, make me meek to follow the steps of thy wounded feet. My thought is now for the souls of men. I have lost my life to find it again. Ere since one day in a quiet place, I met the master face to face. I met the master. I met. Yeah.
Thank you, Lord. What a powerful message. Well, my task today to allow us a five-minute quick break to catch our breath, to stretch our legs, to visit with your neighbor. Maybe you're sitting next to someone 
you were sitting next to before lunch. Just say hello. Take a quick restroom break or visit the tables to purchase your ticket for the upcoming concert. Now at this time, we'll have Miss Beverly come with the gifts, but don't forget to take it all in. It's been a great day so far. another jury box. This is ticket number 253. It's ticket 253. Congratulations. The next gift is a statue of an elephant. If you have any deltas in, they might want this. Ticket number 070. The next gift that we have is a throw monogram with balanced women. This is ticket number zero one five. Ticket zero one five. <laughs> All right, and our last gift this is a uh, glass three little candles holder. And they say it's blessed, grateful, and And this is ticket number 369. Ticket number 369. That concludes our gifts for today. What? Nope, got one more. I keep forgetting this one. This is just a picture plaque. Ticket number 257. Thank you so much, ladies. It's a quick reminder, this is the five-minute break. We're going to go ahead and go forward. We're not going to have a break. Let's give God a hand while the power of God is moving. Today is the day. It is indeed an honor to introduce a dedicated, driven, Bible-walking, Bible-talking, God-fearing woman of God, Minister Brenda Clark. Minister Clark was born in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, 
She attended the University of Alabama, Roll Tide. In 1998, Minister Brenda founded Helpmate Ministry for Women, where she stands firm on the Word of God. She believes in God's word to cancel Satan's plan to steal, kill, and destroy. And her goal is to promote God's plan that we may have life and have it more abundantly. She is a member of Greater Shiloh Baptist Church under the pastoral care of Pastor Michael Wesley. She will not sit down, back up, until she has stood up stayed up and prayed up for Jesus. I present to some and introduce to others none other than Minister Brenda Clark. I know I've been changed. I house tonight today all day from this morning all the way up to this period God is sending us a message and it's my prayer it's my prayer that we're not just here to have a good time that we are here to actually receive what God is feeding to us through all of our speakers, through Sister Wesley and through the finance guru and through Brenda and now through me and what our pastor feeds us weekly is to make a difference in our lives. I want to thank God, thank uh, Minister Barnes and thank Pastor Wesley for this opportunity again to preach, teach God's word. I want you to open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 14, and we're going to be looking at verses 10, 11, and 12. A lot of folk have been talking to me, been telling me, you're praying for me. I appreciate that. Appreciate Natasha and April that have been with me all day today, fulfilling my needs. Appreciate those women from Helpmate Ministries that are here and I send my love to every one of my greatest Shiloh sisters and every one of my helpmate ministry sisters. I love you guys. Amen. Exodus chapter 14, verses 10, 11, and 12. I'll be reading from the Living Bible. And there the word of God says, as the Egyptian army approached the people of Israel, God saw them far in the distance, speeding after them, and they were terribly frightened and cried out to the Lord to help them. And they turned against Moses, whining, have you brought us out here to die in the desert because there were not enough graves for us in Egypt? Why did you make us leave Egypt? Isn't this what we told you while we were slaves? We told you to leave us alone. We said it would be better to be slaves to the Egyptians than dead in the wilderness. But Moses told the people, don't be afraid. 
Just stand where you are and watch, and you will see the wonderful way the Lord will rescue you today. The Egyptians you are looking at, you will never see them again. The Lord will fight for you, and you won't need to lift a finger. Meditate with me on the subject rescue at the Red Sea. The rescue at the Red Sea. The Israelites were out of balance. Today we've heard a lot about balance. We're to eat a balanced diet. We're to balance work and family. We have to even balance our checkbooks, balance our money. And balance, simply put, is finding a sense of harmony in your life, finding peace in an environment that is always changing. Balance is personal. It's a choice. It's a decision that only you can make for yourself. And the reason it's personal is because every woman in here does not live in the same environment. We don't, we don't eat the same foods. We don't dress the same way. We don't have the same provisions. You like chicken salad and somebody else prefers tuna salad. So our environments are not the same. They're different because we are different. But there is one thing that is constant in the life of every female in here. That constant is change. That's a constant in our lives. All of our lives go through change. The songwriter wrote the words, everything must change. Nothing stays the same. Everyone must change. No one stays the same. The young become the old. Mysteries do unfold. That's the way of time. Nothing and no one stays the same. He goes on to say that there are not many things in life you can be sure of, except rain comes from the clouds, Sun lights up the sky and hummingbirds do fly. Change is constant in every life. And as I meditated on this, I, I, I asked God the question then, how do we find balance in our lives when everything in our life is topsy-turvy? What do you mean everything in life is topsy-turvy. You lay down early, you get up early. You lay down late, you still got to get up early. <laughs> you got children who were at one time cuddly little angels that you just love to put up to your breast and, and nurture them, but then they, they began to change because they began to grow up and they didn't want you to rub them on their chest anymore. They didn't want you to kiss them on the forehead in public anymore because what? They were changing. Not only do things in our life change, ladies, but it's, 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 it's also the fact that we even have to go through what? The young folk don't know what I'm talking about. Keep on living. So, so how, how do we balance what we don't know is coming when we don't know how it's coming, when we don't know when or where it's coming? How do you balance things that you cannot see clearly? Well, I'm about to tell you. The first thing we need to do is face it. You have to face change. Whatever is happening in your life right now is real. It's real. You can't continue to avoid it. You can't continue to pretend that it doesn't exist. You can't just leave it. You've got to face whatever change it is in your life. 
On September the 10th, I turned 65. Wasn't nothing I could do about it. Not a thing. But celebrate being what? 65. I don't think 65 too bad myself. I like to feel like I still got it going on. But I also know that, that, that the enemy wants to destroy us. He does not want us to be able to roll with the punches. He, he wants to see us die in the wilderness of life. Talk about change. I grew up with a, we had one phone in the house. It was a rotary phone. Young folk don't even know what that is today. Well, you know, you had to put your finger in the hole and <laughs> dial it around, and then you got to wait till it clicks all the way back before you could dial another number. <laughs> and not only that, I don't know about you, but our phone, I picked it up one day and somebody else was on it. You know what? It was a party line. <laughs> but look what we got today. Look what we got today. We, you got, we got cell phones. Samsungs, iPhones, Androids, we use Sprint, we use AT&T, we use Apple. You might not want to learn how to use all of those devices, but you need to. Those who don't know how can ask a four-year-old and they can tell you how to use it. Change. I remember a salesperson came knocking on the door one day at mom and daddy's house and, 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 and uh, they were selling encyclopedias. And my dad had financed a whole set of encyclopedias so that we would have something to study, so that we could find the information. And today we Google, we Bing, we Safari, everybody got a search engine. Encyclopedias are extinct. Change. We had one black and white TV and it had three channels, a humpback, and a piece of wire for an antenna. Change. You can't be afraid to face change. The Israelites were afraid to face change. Even though they had spent 430 years in captivity, even though they had been delivered from locusts and frogs and lice and gnats and flies and bloody water, God had delivered them from all of that. When he attacked the Egyptians, he did not allow his children to be a part of the attack. And yet they dared to say it would have been better to stay in Egypt and be slaves under Pharaoh. I want to back up a little bit so I can make this make sense. God told Moses and Aaron, he said, I want you to go on down there and tell Pharaoh to let my people go so that they can come and worship me. They went to Pharaoh ten times. The first nine times, Pharaoh either said no or he said yes, and he was lying. Pharaoh didn't like change either. But God commands change within us. The word of God says, don't be conformed to this world, but be ye what? Transformed. That's changed. Transformed by the renewing of your mind. So through Moses, God showed Pharaoh that he was and is the all-powerful, almighty, all-knowing God under whom everything is under his control. It was then and it still is today. He is the only wise and living God. Therefore, he enables us to face change knowing, knowing, not doubting the power of God, that in order to move up, you first got to move forward with confidence, confidence not in yourself, but confidence that if you ask God anything in the name of Jesus, he will hear you. Not only do you have to face change, you have to embrace it. Every one of us goes through changes. Bankruptcy, 
divorce, death, sickness, unemployment, discrimination, IRS, back taxes, debt. If I didn't name yours, you just call it out because it's in there too. And if I, if, I, if, if I could put all of those things in a category, I would call it bondage. You may not experience the bondage of a working slave like the Israelites did or like some of our foreparents and grandparents did, but you got to know this, Satan wants to destroy you. Jesus even asked, asked, asked Saul, why, why do you kick against a prick? When he has given us everything that we need in order to face and embrace change, and yet we still try to have things our way. You, we need to realize that our ways are limited and God is limitless. Our ways are finite, but God's ways are infinite. He is God and he is the only one that does not change. He says, I am God and I change not. So when facing your issues, you got to wrap your arms around them, knowing that it is God who will lead you safely through. You may not come out of that situation when you want to, but you got to trust that God is there. And he tells us that if we wait on him, see, we don't like waiting on God. We don't like waiting on God. You, Lord, we need you right now, Lord. We need you to come right now. Well, he can come right now but only if he chooses to do so. The Bible says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. But you got to wait, I say, on the Lord. Right now, you're waiting on me. <laughs> we embrace our change. We embrace it without fear. Let me tell you how you do it without fear. Brendia talked about, and, it, and I was... I was just sitting there in awe about how similar our messages are, and I knew that God had sent this word. In order for you to overcome fear, you got to be in relationship with God. It's just like she said, you got to read your Bible every day. You got to give a devotional every day. You got to meditate every day. You got to get in your car. You got to go to work. You got to pray on the job. You got to pray in the church. Everything you do ought to involve Jesus. Otherwise, you're not prepared when the enemy comes to attack you. Now, now, Moses understood that. He understood that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of sound mind. Now, Moses was leading two million people, at least two million. I know in our minds, we just think it was just a little crowd by like it is in here, but he was leading close to two million or more people. And, and, and all of these people were whining and complaining and they were blaming him. Why did you bring us out here to die? Same way we treat Pastor Wesley sometimes. Pastor didn't come to see me when I was sick. He sent the deacon. Pastor didn't call me when my mama died. It's the truth. When you got Jesus, and we say that, we say, I got Jesus and I don't need what? Nobody else. But here was Moses out here leading all of these people, these two million people. And, and, and it wasn't just the people. They, they had their horses, they had their sheep, they had their cattle, they had their wagons, they had their furniture, they, they had everything that God had given them that previously belonged to the Egyptians. They had a load of stuff with them. No doubt they possibly traveled in tribes so they, they could keep up with each other's families. But, but, but they were embracing the opportunity to get out of bondage, but only 
temporarily. Temporarily. You know something about the Red Sea? We all got one. We all go through one. And in order to go through it, you, you got to trust the changes that God allows in your life. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind. And lean not to your own understanding. But yet we got to put our fingers in it. We got to dip our hands in the cookie jar. Because we got to call a bank. Because we know the bill coming due and we don't have the money. And we got to call the boyfriend even though he just slapped out of us, we got to call him and say, I'm sorry, because we want him back, because we're scared to be alone. It's time to be real, ladies. You can come up in church, and, 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 and we can shout, and we can dance, and we can do all of those things we want to do, but God knows our heart. He knows our hearts. So we got to trust God with all of our heart, all of our soul, and all of our mind and stop trying to lean on our own understanding. God knows where you are, every one of us. He knows the verse. He knows the chapter. He knows the book. Why? Because he wrote the book. So he knows everything that is in there. Now, here these folk, these two million folk getting ready to cross the Red Sea. Red Sea is about 220 miles wide. It's about 7,200 feet deep. It's got over 1,200 species of fish in it, including 44 different species of sharks. It's a long and narrow sea. It's about 1,400 miles long. And when they got out to sea, they embraced fear instead of faith. I know we say, my, my, my. How many of us? We couldn't even face Florence. <laughs> What's it going to do in Alabama? Is it coming to Alabama? I'll open Walmart, give you some water <laughs> and some bread and some milk. Wasn't even predicted to come this way. But there they were, facing the Red Sea. And your Red Sea might be different, but the solutions are the same. They looked behind them, and Pharaoh was back there. He had 600 chariots filled with soldiers. The desert, the wilderness was on their right. The desert was on their left. Pharaoh was behind, and the Red Sea was in front. Anybody ever felt surrounded? You ever felt like you were just in that place where nothing would come in? You had been praying, but nothing would come in, and, and you couldn't seem to come out of there. Everything around you was messed up. The Israelites started whining and complaining. That's the wrong thing to do when you get in a place like that. Don't you get tired of talking to folk that every time you talk to them, I ain't doing too good today. My head hurt, my back hurt, my leg hurt, and my arm hurt, and my nose hurt, and my elbow hurt. <laughs> Learn how to say when folks say, how you doing, I'm blessed. I'm doing well today. I feel good in the Lord. Because you know what? That person you're telling can't do a thing about your aches and pains. Stop whining and complaining. And learn how to sing a few songs. Sing a song like Psalm 27, 2 through 4, when the wicked, even my enemies, come upon me to eat up my flesh. They stumbled and they fell. Sing a song like Psalm 27 and 5. In the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his house. In the secret place of his tabernacle shall he hide me, and then he will set me upon a rock. Sing a song like Psalm 34 and 7. The angel of the Lord 
guides me and guards me. The angel of the Lord rescues me. Why? Because I reverence him. To God be the glory. These folk wanted to give up. But there was one person in their midst who was determined to walk by faith. When change comes in your life, don't let the devil fool you. God told Moses, he said, Moses, I tell you what I want you to do. Forget about all of those folk that are whining. Forget about all of those folk that are complaining. I want you to take the rod. It's the same rod that I told you to take in front of Pharaoh. And I told you that when you get there, uh, to, to have Aaron throw it on the floor, and I'm going to turn it into a serpent. It's the same rod that when the magicians of Pharaoh saw that, they threw their rods and it turned into a serpent also. But then the serpent of God ate the serpents of Pharaoh. That same rod, God said, I, wanna take, I want you to take that rod and I want you to just wave it. And it's amazing. That all it takes is a wave from God. I want you to wave it over the Red Sea. And when Moses waved it over the Red Sea, the waters began to stand up. I don't know how tall the walls were, but it should have been at least 25, 35 feet of water based on the size of the Red Sea. And the Bible says that they were able to walk across on dry land. Now you tell me how you got a wall on the right and a wall of water on the left and not a drop is hitting the ground below. They were able to walk across on dry land. And now, 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 they, went, they didn't walk across in a couple of hours because the trip across the Red Sea was at least 200 miles. You see, sometimes you have to stay in the safety of God for a while. Sometimes God wants to know that you're going to pass the test that he's putting you through. It's easy to cry, Lord, Lord, when things going wrong. But God wants to see how long you're going to stay on your knees. He wants you to see how long you're going to stay on your face before him. It's a test. They began to walk across. That's another thing we got to do. Learn how to walk in it. Because when you walk in it, you actually are walking into your destiny. You can't get to what God has promised you by sitting on your bunions. You got to get up. And you got to be able to walk with the Lord. Some of us ain't willing to walk across the street to get a blessing. They didn't know where they were going. Moses told them they were going to what? The promised land. At the time, they had not figured out what it was, the promised land. But those of us who read our Bibles know that God has given us a lot of promises. He says, I promise never to leave you and never to forsake you. He says, I promise that I, I want you to prosper and I want you to be in good health. I, I, I promise that, that when you need my help, I'm going to pick you up and I'm going to carry you. I, I promise to supply your every need. I promise to give you food and clothing and shelter. I promise to be your comfort in your time of sorrow. I, I promise to walk with you. I promise to talk with you. I promise that I will never leave you alone. They had to make it to the other side. And when you make it to the other side, you can look back and you can see that the enemy that was after you is no longer there. Moses told the Israelites, see, when, when they were looking back, he said, let me tell you something. You look at them one last time. Because the folk you looking at today, the ones you see right now, you will never see them again. And when they got to the other side, it's something about making it to the other side. I don't know about you, but this world is not my home. I'm just passing through on my way to the other side. And when I get to the other 
I'm going to look back on my enemies and say how, how, how I got over, how I got over, how I got over. When I get to the other side, it's time to celebrate it. God took them to where he promised to take them. Now, it was their fault that they walked around in the wilderness for 40 years after that. So you got a choice to make. But when they got there, they began to celebrate. When we celebrate Jesus, that means we give him the glory. We thank him for all that he's done for us. We thank him for being our shelter. We thank him for being our way out of no way. You've come through the storm. And you've come through the rain. You've come through sickness, heartache, and pain. My, 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 sunshine has come. Y'all remember that? You've been hurt for a little while in life. You've been sick for a little while in life. You've been talked about by a lot of folk in life. Your money been low sometimes. But one day, one day, your sunshine broke through the cry. My sunshine has come. Ain't no more rain in this cloud. To God be the glory. Praise him when you're up. Praise him when you're down. I got a new walk. I got a new talk. Praise him for his goodness. Praise him for his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Celebrate what he's done for you. Did he bring you? Did he bring you? If you have to reach way down, Jesus, he'll pick you up. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. The arrows that fly by day, the terrors by night. For God is a very present help. In a time of trouble, he says, praise him in the sanctuary. Let everything that had breath praise ye the Lord. Praise him on the drums. Praise him on the guitar. Praise him with your voice. Praise him by lifting your hands. Praise him. With running in your feet, praise him with all that is within you, and then thank him for your rescue at the Red Sea. I just want to tell you it's going to be a blessing and a benediction. We're almost there. We're ready to go home, but I want you to leave before we have this moment of prayer. I want to tell you, man, it's been a powerful day. These ladies have spoken up here today, and we thank God for all of them. I believe that women's ministry ought to be just this, an opportunity where women minister to women. As pastor who has been leading for over 30 years, there have been some uncomfortable moments in my life. There have been some uncomfortable moments in ministry. And I have grown to understand that there are some situations that will be best handled by another woman. And what I want, I want, I want you to understand, but it still requires equipping. You still got to be, I think Brenda said it, called, trained, equipped, and operating in the gift. Don't just say, just because I'm a woman, I ought to be able to minister to another woman. No. 
There has to be that call, that has to be that anointing, that has to be that will of God, that plan of God for your life in that way. I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of all of you. And I thank God for this day of fellowship. Haven't you been blessed? And we're going to say this and we're going to move to the close. There are tapes available for all of the sessions. You can get them individually. If you wanted the first one or the second one or the third one or the fourth one, you can get them individually. Or if you wanted the whole set, if you wanted the whole set, you might have to order the set. But I know that all of the sessions that have already gone for will be waiting on you when you come out of these doors. You did not stop to pick up your ticket for the next great event. Well, the great event is going to continue tomorrow. We're going to continue this tomorrow. Tomorrow here at Greater Shallow, we have, I think I saw 75 or 80 women up here. They're going to be singing the women chorus. And the word of God is going to come forward. I'm in the middle of a series called The Bible Has the Answers to Our Problems. And tomorrow we're going to deal with the problem of love. And it's going to be on. So you want to be with us? And if you have not made plans, be with us for the Vanessa Bale Armstrong. How many know who Vanessa Bale Armstrong is? Let me see your hand. How many do not know who she is? Let me see your hand. Be honest. Just be honest. Vanessa Bale Armstrong is a, is a gospel recording artist. artist. She sung that song. One of the songs she sang is Peace Be Still. And um, so her and her sisters will be here. What we're getting ready to do at our church. We're getting ready to reclaim Christian burial on our campus. And we're going to build a life celebration memorial park on our campus. A, a, a above ground mausoleum. And, and what we're going to do, we're going to commemorate the tragic event that occurred in our church history, in Greater Shiloh's history, when we call Shiloh. In 1902, when Booker T. Washington was the keynote speaker at our church, after he finished speaking, when Booker T. got up to finish his speech, or should I say when he finished, one of the men, just like we do, got up and came to the pulpit to congratulate him. And when he went back to take his seat, another man had slid in the seat. And the two men were standing on the pulpit and they were arguing. And one of the ladies in the choir stand saw what was happening and she said, fight. But they thought she said, fire. And people started panicking. The church was packed. It was 3,000 inside. It was another 1,000 outside. People were trying to get a look at who Booker T was and what he looked like. And the more moderators said, there's no fight, there's no fire, more people thought he was saying fire. And everybody started trying to run out of the door. And people outside were pushing to get in. And the first wave of people fell. And the people inside just kept right on running and ran right over all of those people. And 120 people died in one of the worst tragedies in church history. We gotta remember that. That has always gotta be remembered in our history. Because if, even in this sanctuary today, and I smiled as we, as we broke for lunch, everybody tried to go out the same set of doors. When I thought to myself, we could've gone that way, we could've gone that way, we could've gone that way, we could've gone that way. A lot of different ways to have gotten to where we were going. But we did the same thing that they did in 1902. Fortunately, nobody got hurt today. And so we got to always keep lessons like that, real life lessons before people. And help people to remember what has happened. And so we're going to do all of that on that outside. And that project is going to start very soon and we're using the Vanessa Bell Armstrong concert to kick that off and we're going to move right into construction as a matter of fact the playground will be moved this week so construction actually starts this week and we're going to begin to move with what we've been talking about doing and so you're going to see so I want you to make sure that you get a, get a ticket it's, it's going to be a great concert 
She just recently sang at Aretha Franklin's funeral. And she'll be right here on the stage here at our church. And this is not limited to men or to women. This is for everybody. And so while you're here today, you get the gift of $15. If you come tomorrow, maybe $15. But after that, it will be 20 God bless you. I want us to pray. You've heard a lot of information. You've heard a lot of challenges. But now it's time to put it into use. So what I want you to do, I, I want you to come. I want us to come together to pray. I want us to come to the altar. If you know that you've been in some ways out of balance, we know that our world is out of balance. We know that our society is out of balance. In some cases, our families are out of balance. Some ways, our finances are out of balance. Some ways, our spirits are out of balance. And I just want to pray with you and just pray for you. If you're missing a coin purse, please stop by the registration table. Stewardship education will be facilitating a small group feature in the 52 weeks to fall in love with your money. That book that April Kelly was talking about, our stewardship team will be teaching that doing small groups. So you can sign up for that as well. But now we're getting ready to send you home and I don't want you to go home empty. I want you to go home with a determination that you want to be balanced. You want to flourish you want to prosper and you want to succeed and you want to pass on what you've heard you want to work with your finances you want to get your resources together you want to get your insurances you want to take the eye out of your money you want to be successful we got to cross through our red seas and be able to look back and see that God has delivered us all of those lessons we've learned today So now we ask God together. Father, we thank you for this gathering today. What a day it's been. It began with a great moment of praise. We thank you for Lenitra and for the praise team that led us into your presence to open us up. We thank you for all of the women who have come together. The team that led the planning and went through all of the rigor to make arrangements through all of the ways that they have. We thank you for them. We thank you for the speakers who have come today, who have poured over prayer and scripture and labored in their prayer closets to be able to come today to share with us your word. And we glorify your name because they have done that. And we know that your word, Lord, will not go out and return void. But it will accomplish the purpose for which you sent it. And we have to admit today, God, that we are out of balance. In some cases, we're out of step with you. In some cases, we're out of step with our fellow man or our fellow sister. So we come today asking for forgiveness. Forgiveness of our sins, forgiveness of our hostilities, forgiveness of the bitterness or whatever it might be that have held us in some kind of way against another human being. And it has caused us, Lord, to not be able to receive and experience the joy that we know that we should be able to experience through you. We come today lifting up one another. Lifting up, Lord, our girlfriends, our family members, our spouses, those, Lord, that we work with, Lord, these in the community, the barbaric society that we live in, Lord, we lift them up and we want to commit ourselves afresh here today that the older women will reach out and begin to mentor the younger women again. 
And the younger women will receive the mentorship and the friendship and the teaching that will come from the elders. It is true. That's how the church was built. That's how the church was kept straight. The old mothers of the church would say to us sometimes, son, you know you're not doing right. You're not going the right way. It would put out the fan and cause us to spit out the gum or whatever it was. And we had to be obedient. Bring us back to that place of relationship. Help us to reconcile the generations one to another. And then help us to be reconciled to you. God, you do know the plans you have for us. Plans for good and not evil. Plans to give us a future and a hope. And we thank you for that. And so today we call on you. And you said that if we call on you, you would answer us. And you would show us great and mighty things that we don't yet see. So reveal to us the answers to our problems. Where there's financial weakness among us, heal it. Reveal to us what we can do practically to get our financial houses together. God, we just thank you. We want to be the church. We want to be your people. We want to let the light of Christ shine in us every day. Thank you for every woman. Thank you for the men that flanked outside, that served. Thank you for the culinary team that fed us. Thank you for the media team that kept the music and the screen and all and everything. Thank you for the custodial staff that had the building clean. Whatever anybody did, thank you. We praise you now. As we pray now, as we prepare to go up from here, we pray that you would dismiss us from here, but never from your holy presence. Give us traveling grace and arriving mercies. Bless the sick among us. Somebody's in here today that really didn't feel well, but they came. Thank you for them. Heal, God. Somebody's heart is broken because loved ones have been removed. Heal. They pushed on. They came in spite of. Bless them, Lord. And as we go our way, dismiss us now from this place, but never from your holy presence. As we ask again that the grace of God, the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, will rest, rule, and abide with each one of us now, your children, until we meet again. God's people said amen, amen, amen. Listen, hug somebody. Hug another girlfriend. Hug somebody. Tell them that God loves you and so do I. See you next time. God bless you.